Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. I'm Jacqueline Terrebone, the editor in chief of Gallery Magazine. And I have joining me today the wonderful design gallerist, Thomas Lavin. And we're going to be talking about how collecting emerging artists can electrify the home. No one is better to speak on this topic, I think, than Thomas. And um, we featured his fantastic home in our latest winter issue. And it's just amazing to see this personal collection, how he integrates art and furniture together into a real place where he can live and is, is his home, but is totally am animated by figurative art. So Thomas, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, I'm thrilled. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you too. And you know, it's been almost exactly a year since I last saw you in person when I toured your home with you. So I can't, I, like, I need to look at my calendar. It might be to the date one year. It was so much fun having you guys over in, in, re, in person, in, in humanity, <laughs> and having espressos and just touring around. That was right. So I was in Los Angeles for Freeze LA, and the city was abuzz with the art scene. And um, Thomas had me over to see his collection, which you know I had heard about, and they're like, no, he's really into art. And I feel like I hear that all the time about people. And you're like, sure, of course they are. But like I got over and I was like, oh my gosh, like your walls were filled with people we've covered in gallery that we want to cover in gallery. Like you are on like the absolute pulse of the art world. And then I saw you later the day at the fair, just like right going from booth to booth and seeing how you connect. So how did it all begin for you? How did you start collecting art? How did I start collecting art? You know, it was always something that I was interested in. I was an art history major at UCLA. I studied my, the two areas of focus were Byzantine and contemporary American. So it was, a, it was an interesting juxtaposition. Then of course, the more I got into art, the more I realized that Byzantine is utterly contemporary. I was too afraid to buy figurative, which is what I really wanted because it, I just, I get the emotion, I get a sensibility, I get sort of what's happening off of the people in the paintings. So I started buying abstract because it was safe, it was intellectual, it was, it was um, at least could be non-emotional. And there was a painting at the Acme Gallery for their 20th anniversary by Kurt Cowper, it was a study. And I saw it, it was a small piece on a wall and I went up to one of my friends who owned the gallery and I'm like, I love that. And he's like, it's yours. And I was so proud of my first figurative piece. And then I went over to the other gallerist, Bob Gunderman, who's actually now painting, mm -hmm. and we're showing him. And um, I said, I'm really excited. I bought the Kurt Cowper, and he looked mortified. He's like, it's already sold. And oh I was God. so bummed out. And so I think that sort of put a kibosh on it. And then later they were able to bring in a painting by Kurt. Meanwhile, I met a, my, one of my dearest friends, Robert Shield, who's a, an extraordinary collector in Los Angeles, and his focus is, is figurative. And I went over and I saw his collection, I was so inspired by his intellect, his bravery, his passion. I'm like, I'm in now. So that's sort of how I moved into figurative, which I've been collecting over the past five years. And for you, was that sort of a gradual transition where you were placing, you know, figurative from abstract to figurative, like one room at a time, or is it just like one day makeover, it's a different house, like it's a different collection? No, it was different steps into bravery. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you really, you have to be, or at least I want to feel so confident about what I'm doing. And I always feel, as I think as humans, we're always like, well, how's the world looking at us? What are they thinking? Am I doing the right thing? Have I made a mistake? So I kind of moved into it um, slowly. And then at some point I kind of jumped in and I remember being with Robert once. I was like, oh, I think this is great. And what do you think about this one? And, and what's, what's the philosophy driving this artist practice? So then I sort of moved into it full force. That's great. Um, and what have you done with all the abstract art then that was once in the house? <laughs> I'm doing- Is it a closet? Doing, like, is it, a, you know? Everything is in storage. Not only is the, the abstract in storage, but also now I'm, I've moved into the realm where the, the house is not big enough to accommodate all the art. So now it's sort of a rotating, a rotating exhibition, which mm -hmm. I swore I would never do. I would love to know more about how you then decide what furniture should be in the house. Like what is your approach to decorating when there's so much happening on the walls? Like these are not 
shy artworks that you've surrounded yourself with? No, they, you're right. They are truly not shy. I think someone wrote on the Instagram after you published the story, it looks like the man's living with a bunch of friends, which is totally true. Oh, um, I, I moved into my house uh, about 10 years ago. It's a 1958 modern. And my friend Gary Hutton, the San Francisco interior designer, designed it for me. And Gary has actually really gained a reputation as being an interior designer to major collectors. Uh, he gets published for the work he's done for Charles Schreier. They've got a book out called, um, oh my goodness, Artful, Artful Living um, by uh, Art, House? Art House, yes, by Asseline. So that's yeah, Gary. Yeah, great. Trump. Wonderful. So Gary is inherently this incredible, has this incredible sensibility, just obviously of design, because he's what I think one of the greatest working in America, but also for collectors. When he did the house, I wasn't collecting. But his sensibility went right into it, so I really didn't have to do anything around it. Although it was funny, there was one moment where I decided I was going to wallpaper my den with something really extraordinary. And I said to Gary, I said, what do you think? He's like, he's like, you're just starting to buy art. He's like, leave it for art. And I, at that point, I think I had maybe two paintings in the den. And um, lo and behold, he was right, because now there's this kind of like horror vacui. There's no space to breathe. Right. No, I love this. Um the sofa and the piping on it, just so beautiful. The silhouettes are highlighted by the piping. And then you have that Robin F. Williams above it. it it's not like there's chintz below. You're not having this like fight as there is in the painting. <laughs> no, as there, is, as there is in the painting. Well, and what's fun about the house is because, you know, because it's not large, because I don't want to move, I thought to myself, well, what can I do to change it up? So every Memorial Day, I put all the white slippers uh, slip covers on, covering up the mohair, the wool, and the silk, and the house becomes white. And we lift up the rugs. My, it's my ode to the East Coast. And so, if you walked around now, you would see that it's actually much more dynamic than during the summertime. How very old-fashioned of you! Right. I love it. It keeps um, it fresh. And then, does that sort of white backdrop and the furniture like that? Does that help you then, if you want to change things up too? You must have more freedom with this sort of canvas. Yeah, you know what? I really don't change the furniture, which is why it's nice to have the slipcovers, but it leaves room. Like I just acquired a new sculpture, so that can go on a coffee table. And like as Michael Slensky said when he interviewed for me, he's like, what's the next frontier? Because you've got a lot of painting, some photography. And I said, sculpture, I said, but I have no room. So of course I started buying sculpture and I'm like, okay, what <laughs> spaces can I put it on without sort of overwhelming where I live? And is sculpture, I mean, the paintings, you know, they go on the wall. Sculpture, is that challenging for you to place? Are you moving things around and sort of seeing what's happening? Is it that like, it's you just, know, it just starting, so and different and, and knowing where to place it, I think would be like, you could have to like sort of live with it for a while. Well, right now, so my actually, one of the first pieces of work I ever bought was a sculpture by the Los Angeles artist, Jedediah Caesar who's represented by Suzanne Bettmutter. And it's the resin piece that captures his experience of Los Angeles. And that one's so large that it sort of lives permanently against a wall. So right now I'm looking at tabletop. Okay. I just picked up a sculpture from the artist Shika, his name is what out of my head, from Yossi Milo, who's really doing some wonderful things. Uh, uh, multi interdisciplinary, he's working in sculpture, photography, painting, performance art. And he's really, I think he's really a man on the rise. He's got a solo show at the Crayon Factory right now. I love it. You're just so on top of everything. <laughs> you really know your artists and um, you, you click through them so well. I'd love to talk about some of the artists that are actually in the house and um, who are important to you and how, you know, you, you came to collect their work. Because I know for you, it, it really is living with friends in a way that you connect with the artists who are in your house. So um, Louis Fertina would maybe be the first one I'd love for you to share a little about, you know, how you started collecting him and, and why. You, Lou Fertino, uh, my friends started talking about him. I can't remember if Robert was speaking about him or another art collecting friend. And he was working on smalls, you know, things that were about this large. And they were, they were not expensive and it was really, it was depicting a gay culture, queer life, in a way that had never been done before. Domestic scenes, friendship, intimacy, um, 
thoughtful, meditative. And so I started, I started thinking of a few of them. And then I was going to New York and one of our friends said, you know, why don't you go see Leo at his studio? So he went, and I, I, I mean, he was so young. He still, he will always be much younger than me. And he was, it's really great to get to know the artist that you've got in your collection, because I know we've met him, we know him. He was so passionate, so excited. He'd been working on a series of these smalls and he literally just kept hanging them on the lights. What do you guys think about this one? What do you think about this one? And it was such a treat, especially when I look back now, he's had such a meteoric rise that his work is, is, is grown so sophisticated, so dynamic. You can see uh, one of his pieces in the back on that slide on the lower left. Right. Working in painting, drawings, uh, uh, you know, uh, pastels. So it was wonderful to meet him and now see his career evolve and people are really recognizing him not only as one of our great contemporary talents, but also the voice that he brings to, you know, queerness in gay America that has heretofore been untold. And you have several of his pieces throughout the house. It's not just one. Right, I have four. One, two, three, I have four. And then sometimes I want to go to my friends' houses and try and lift another one, but they watch them too much when I'm there. <laughs> I love this one. I, th I think what he's doing is so interesting. Well, you know, he's really riffing. I mean, he's riffing. I think he's got his own voice that you see you know, shades of, of course, uh, the greats and the great artists of the 20th century, Matisse, Picasso. Um, in this one, I think you get sort of like this ode to the still life, which has always has been in, you know, art history since time immemorial. You can look at Pompeii and mosaic floors and see the, the dinner table. So um, he's a very sophisticated and intellectual man who is really making the art so accessible to, to, to people. That's great. And then another one. Oh, that's such a good one, too. Isn't that stunning? I know. It's absolutely stunning. And then Paul Sapoya is another artist I know that, that you collect. And I mean, completely different medium, different take. How, how did you get to know him? How, how were you drawn to um, his photography? I had started seeing his work, and I can't remember if it was in galleries or I saw little magazine articles. Again, you know, when you're collecting, your friends start talking about it. And I was speaking with uh, my friend Kevin and he said, you know, I've got this artist, I want you to meet him, I think he's on the rise. So we went over to Paul's studio. And again, studio visits are, it's the best. So Paul was in there, he had a bunch of big photographs up, he had some of his books out and he was working on things. And he had, he had one piece, which is not in this photograph. And I looked at it, I was absolutely captivated by it. And it was very odd because all of his work is, is photographed in reflection. So I mm -hmm. knew that I was looking at a reflection of what was taking place in the room. And in a weird way, it reminded me of uh, John Van Eyck's Arnold Feeney wedding from 1450s, where it's the wedding scene. I think you'll know the wedding scene. You've got the dog, which represents fidelity and this beautiful, sumptuous fabric. And in the background, you have a convex mirror, which is reflecting everything that's happening in the room. And I thought it was amazing how here's a contemporary artist who is really in some ways referencing what was happening, you know, 500 years ago, but with this sort of, you know, new medium. And I loved it. And again, I loved what he was saying about the, the visage, the people, culture, um, and then how he was referencing Maplethorpe. But of course, sometimes I'm very slow to make a decision. And so I couldn't, I couldn't decide. My friend Kevin was like, you know, you got, you got to decide. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to do it. And then it <laughs> turned out that the Met had just bought the exact same piece. So, which I had no idea. And I was like, wow, all right. So that was, that was fine. Right. Um, and Paul, like so many of the artists I've met is incredibly smart, passionate and driven. And he has such a sense of, of what he's up to, what he's bringing to the world. And buying uh, these emerging artists like this, I mean, the story you just told, like things aren't sitting around for a long time when things start to take off for an artist. Are you good at making those quick decisions and judgments? Or do you like to sit on things and then maybe regret that? Like, how does There's, that work? I talk about with my friends, especially with Robert, sometimes the, the, the suffering we go through because we missed it. It right. was like, should we, shouldn't we, should we? But I remember when I, when I first started looking at art, um, I was looking at a photograph by Alex Prager and it mm -hmm. was $2,500. I'm like, $2,500? I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, <laughs> you know, I don't think you can touch your photographs now for less than $50,000. So, right. um, so, but it's also, you know, it's a process, you know, and I've had some, I've had what they would say, I've had good market luck because mm -hmm. I chose people that ended up having rises and I didn't buy the work because it was 
someday going to be, you know, famous or valuable about it because I loved what the artist was saying and how it was speaking to my own sensibility and my own life history. And what about Kurt Copper? He's another one I know that you have your eye on and is part of your collection. He's incredibly meticulous. Kurt is what is a gentleman that I have not met, although we've corresponded. And he paints in a very traditional style, extremely meticulous, down to, I think, sometimes a mink hair brush. And I, I, I think the way he takes, like in the background right now, you can see the drawing on the right um, of this sort of like monumentally sized woman. And the drawing is extremely detailed. So I think that the solidarity of the figure, also how he references contemporary society. Uh, he went through a whole series of, of Clark Gables, I'm uh, sorry, Cary Grants. Um, and oh, when you I look at his those studies, they're yeah, amazing. You always recognize, I've got a painting that he did of a man laying down, which reminds me of, um, oh gosh, Don Draper. <laughs> and you know, maybe Kurt meant that, maybe he didn't, but he's working in this old fashioned sensibility or traditional sensibility, but very contemporary. And again, I bought the work because I love what it's saying, the solo figure, but then the piece that you see in the background, Whitney ended up having a solo show for him. I think the hammer acquired the actual painting that this piece was based off of. That's great. And then I know um, Hope Gangloff is another one. I think she's represented here. Yes, in this you actually see the Kurt Cowper of the man shaving. Oh, nice. Um, you you see, um, Hope Gangloff on the lower right. Mm -hmm. And that is a study of her friend John Wigmore, the lighting artist. And it's actually funny, my friend Ari was over for champagne in the backyard a couple of weeks ago. And we started talking about what she's up to. She's uh, with Poochie now and they represent John Wigmore. And I'm like, I have a portrait of John Wigmore. Like, <laughs> you gotta be kidding. So I think, again, Hope, I mean, if you look at the painting of John Wigmore laying down, I think you see a bit of, um, of oh man, the kiss. 19th century Viennese. I'm Klimt? so glad. Thank you. I think you see a bit of Klimt with the fat. Thank you. It's like where yeah. like, with the fabric, with the red and white check and the blue and white and the green in the background. So I feel like she's representing Klimt, but then also just this idea of portraiture of her friend sort of laying down when you can't see, she's holding a cores, which sort of cracks me up. And then coincidentally, uh, my friend Robert bought the actual portrait, which is Hope works in this, her main paintings are just monumental. So they're, you know, 12 feet wide. I mean, they're, they're huge. And contemporaneously, when I acquired this piece, she was having a solo show at the Stanford Museum. She also curated for them a show where she was able to go to their archives, put together something that she thought was interesting, sort of based on her own, her own philosophy and vernacular. And um, it was coincidental, which I didn't know when I acquired the piece. Well, I, I didn't know John Wigmore is in the same issue another time too. Um, and I didn't realize that he, that's who was in this portrait because he's in <laughs> a story we did on the Cara Hotel that just opened in LA and that he did a lot of the cu custom light fixtures in there. Wow. And I recently was at Pucci and saw some of his pieces. They're, they're fantastic. They're amazing. What a great I know, so it's such a, and it also shows you what a small world we're in at the intersection of art and design. It's so true. There's so much cro crossover and more and more and, and people experimenting, I think in both and that line definitely blurring. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there are some portraits in the house too. There's one of you. Right. Correct? There is, yes. It was a portrait of me painted by Rafi Calendarian. I love it. I love it. So how did this portrait come to be? So I met Rathi when he was having a solo show at um, Suzanne Veltmetters. And he is truly one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. He's, he's, he's dear. And so we became friends and he would come to my parties and we would see each other at other openings. And finally one day he was like, he's like, you are always dressed up. He's like, I love your style. He's like, can I paint you? <clears throat> and I said, absolutely. I said, that would be super. So he came over one day and it was the one time in my life where I had a mustache, which I kind of look at the, at the painting and laugh. And so he came over and, and we just sat and chat, chatted. He drew pictures, he did some sketches, he took some photographs. And I said, the only thing that I ask is that I have first choice of what you're painting. So this came up and he captured me in a way that, that my, I think my dear friends know. 
on the outside, people tell me that I'm sort of calm and collected, but the inside really looks like the background of this painting, very much um, um, the scream. Oh gosh, <laughs> who's, who's that? <laughs> Thank you, yes, Edvard Munch. So the, in my, my interior soul is Edvard Munch, my exterior is this like blue, calm, cool, collected. So, so I acquired this. Meanwhile, the funny story is I was going to um, Art Basel and they had done a seven foot portrait of me that Suzanne was going to have as sort of the marquee of her, of her booth. And so I oh, saw yeah. some of my friends at Art Basel. I said, you guys, I said, come on, let's go take a look. When I got over there and the portrait wasn't up. And so I asked Suzanne where it was, and she said that it had sold to a major LA collector between Los Angeles and Miami. And I was so bummed because I figured I would never see it again. One day I was sitting at my, my desk and one of my design clients texted me and he said, look who I just met. And it was a photograph of me in his client's bowling alley. How fabulous. Again, the smallness of the world. <laughs> That is great. And Rafi, I mean, we featured him last year too in our emerging artist section and just fell in love with his, his work at gallery as well. It, it's incredible what he's doing. So to have a portrait by him of you in your own home. He's, he's so talented. I, and I, I love the way he handles his solo portraiture is very much what you see right now. It's tight. He's very much about the fabric, the background, the details. And if you look at what he's doing now, uh, sort of double portraits, they're quite large. I think, oh gosh, like 48 inches. And the people become very small, sort of relegated almost to this extraordinary background with these tropical ferns, this black background. Mm -hmm. Like I really see the evolution of what Rafi is up to, who I think is one of our great talents. I know, I think it was the Baltimore Museum just acquired some of his work. That's I great. might be wrong, I have to check it, but I know he was picked up by a museum. That's good. Um, and you have also works by Amawako, who I feel like is one of, you know, the hottest, if not the hottest name in portraiture and what's happening right now. Um, how did you start collecting his work? Because it quickly became very not much, not easy to collect his work, very in demand. It, you know, it's the case with a few of the artists that I have in my collection. It was, you know, I think when you're into something, you just find yourself in, in the right place at the right time. So I was, at, uh, I was at the art fair in Miami and uh, Robert and I were going over and he said, you've got to come to Marianne Ibrahim. She's got a new artist. She really believes in him. So Marianne, who I'm sure you've met, is one of the oh, smart, most charming, chicest, and most connected people I've ever met. And her husband, Pierre, was working the booth with her. So Pierre said, let me pull some paintings out. So out of the closet came all of these portraits. And Robert and I were like, yeah, yeah, this is really good. Like, this is really amazing. And we started talking more and it was, it was, it was, he was so talented the way he captured like sort of the internal experience of the people. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like I knew the, the subjects as soon as I saw them. So I picked up a small portrait where I picked up two and Robert's projects was having an opening the next week and I was leaving town. So I went over to the gallery and Robert and I went in. So you can tell Robert's my partner in crime in this realm. And he walked in and the show was so captivating, it was colorful, it was passionate, and three of the pieces already been put on reserve. This is Wednesday morning, the show's not opening until Saturday. We looked at a double self portrait, and I said, this is amazing. And so I spoke with Bennett Roberts, and he's like, you can put it on hold overnight. So I put it on hold overnight, and the next morning I thought, you know what, I have to get it, because it really, I woke up the next morning, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I called Bennett, and he's like, I don't know what's happening, but everything is sold out. Oh and my so God. that was, the last, that was the last, that was the last one. So now I'll visit them somewhere else. It was amazing. That is amazing. And what about um, Tyler Fallon? Tyler Fallon. So, that you had like a, maybe you, um, waited too long or what happened i think there's a little story there too well, he's, so so tyler came out there's a there's another great collector in los angeles d carrison and he sort of keeps us posts on like who he thinks is talented up and coming and so we were looking at pictures of tyler's work and he is he's inspired by caravaggio who i think is one of the greatest painters of all time i go i've been to trips to rome just to go with caravaggio paintings right. so the second of his work i'm like this this man has a sense of light technique uh like sort of ethos that i've seen anybody else's work 
And then I also found out that he that he's being mentored by Amy Chiral, which I think is a great imprimatur of what he's up to. And his sort of his his philosophy driving his work is that is African Americans, people of color in religious work, because when you look at religious work throughout history, it really is the, the white person's experience in 14th, 15th, 16th century, 16th century painting. And so he is painting contemporary scenes of people of color's experience in the world. So I have something called the baptism and it's three guys and it's, it's, it's multi, it's multiracial. It's, 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 at first you don't know what's going on and you realize that it's the baptism, it's this transformation of the soul. He did another painting that, that is just mind blowing, which is really based on Caravaggio's deposition of the cross. And it's the mother after a car accident, after a hit and run, taking care of her son. So oh, he's wow. really, he's so, his work is so moving. People walk into my house, like I get chills just talking about what he's up to because in a split second, you are, you are spread between six centuries, you know, 14th mm -hmm. century to 21st century, sort of like this, this, this idea of religion and passion through a very particular lens. And now you get to see this more dynamic experience of like what's really happening in the world where he's taken a voice, he's taken a position. He's like, you know, we, I'm giving, I'm putting myself and, you know, people who have not been represented in the canvas. So I find them very complex, very dynamic, extremely contemporary. And I don't think anybody's doing what he's up to. So he's just starting. I'm a huge believer in his in his path. Oh, that's great. Um, and what we've been looking at, though, I think is is this Paulina Berskaya? This is Paulina Berskaya, who I've been following also. Uh, she has a sort of Alice Neal sensibility in some ways. Uh, I think her palette is beautiful. I've only known her work to be in this sort of cool palette, and she only paints domestic scenes. So it's self portraits. It's it's she, her husband. She painted a whole series while she was pregnant. Now the baby is born. And it's sort of what they're up to. And I think it has such a wonderful place in art history, just the artists where they are. Yeah, there's something so calming about this and like lazy and in a lazy in a beautiful way. It like transports you there. You feel the dappling of the light, the intimacy, the connection. Well, and it's true. And her painting, to really see them in person, to see her brushstroke and the way she's laid on shadow and light, it's it's really quite compelling. Um, and then I just want to ask you more about like, you know, you've discovered all of these, not just, but you found all of these artists. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people that are emerging. How do you go about finding them? You know, what is, is it a lot of legwork? Is it a lot of, you know, you've spoken a lot about friends that you have. Is it word of mouth? Is it just staying connected with the scene? What, what's your secret? everything, reading, um, you know, there's, the, you know, reading, seeing, talking, asking. What I really wanted to get into collecting, I read some great articles that say, just be in the space that you want to be in. So I just put myself in the space. Now I know gallerists, I know collectors, I know artists. So it becomes a conversation. And sometimes it's just this visceral moment. I was, I was at uh, the Roosevelt show two years ago and uh, Nicodemus was showing an artist, Aaron Gilbert, and there were two paintings that I walked in. I'd never seen anything like it. It was, it was again, I love this sort of reference on art history. So it was, it was, it was utterly mannerist. It was secondary palette. It was oranges, purples, greens. Um, it was a father holding a baby, which I think is so rare in the art historical canon. And the elongation of the thing, I thought this is really extraordinary. It's oil, but it looks like it could be egg tempera and it's on panel. And I loved it. Didn't know who he was, nothing, nothing, nothing. And um, they were like, it was an art fair, so they're like, you have 15 minutes. And in that moment, it's like, I have no idea who this guy is, but I've never seen anything like it. I'm just gonna go with my gut and picked it up. And you know, now he's represented by PPOW and they're having a solo show for him later in the spring. So I'm hoping I can acquire another because I think he's telling such a great story. I hope so too. And I think it's just so exciting to watch the careers of people blossom and I feel like when you acquire someone early don't you feel like you're you're a part of that ride with them like you're so excited for them you're a part of what's happening in their lives oh absolutely especially to know them I mean I had dinner with um, Robin Williams when she had her solo show in Los Angeles last year and I mean she's I mean I mean she's 
for for my for my pocketbook, she's untouchable. Her mm -hmm. work is is unparalleled, and um and she's and she has had such a rise and so deserves it because she's telling a story in a way that no one else is telling it right now. And so it's very exciting to see these artists have their voice recognized for the stories they're telling, which are so important because it's not only about them, it's also about our society. I think that's the thing about contemporary, uh, collecting contemporary um, art these days is, um, is getting the, the, the cultural story. Right. Well, I'm, I'm sure they love to be collected by someone like you two who is so invested in their stories and is interested in what they're doing and um, can really place it within a historical canon and understand what their references might be. And, you know, I, and I think have a real, um, real passion for it. So that's so inspiring, Thomas, and your entire house is just phenomenal. We're thrilled to have it in the um, winter issue of Gallery, which everyone should pick up and check out online at gallerymagazine.com if you wanna see more um, of Thomas's house and really get an in detail look at some of this art because there's so much. And as you can see, you know, it's everywhere. And, um, and, and it's not just one piece on a wall, there's a lot happening. So I'd love for people to, um, if you have any questions, write them into the Q and A and, Thomas and I would be happy to answer them, um, especially Thomas. So just um, let us know if you have any questions for Thomas um, about his collecting, about his um, knowledge of art and furniture and design and how they all work together. As we're waiting for questions, Jackie, thank you so much for having me on. It's such a pleasure. I, I'm passionate about the collecting and the artists and um, it's it's really it's wonderful to be able to talk to talk about. I feel like I'm talking about my children. It would be my children. Oh no, it's so nice. I mean, I think this really brings to life sort of the experience that I had walking through your house with you because it is a story on every wall. It's it's not just like this is my this and this is my that. Like each of these paintings um, means so much to you, and you have such a connection with the artist. Um, which is, is really inspiring. Who, I have a question. Um, who do you have your eye on next? Who do I have my, my eye on next? Ah, I'll tell you who I have my eye on next. Cody Brown, C-O-A-D-Y Brown. Um, she has a solo show up right now at Richard Heller and she, I think she's an extraordinary painter. Again, she has this contemporary point of view, but almost, like the painting that I acquired is almost the sort of manner of sensibility. Mm -hmm. So I think she's, she's really fantastic. Okay, Cody Brown, one to check out. Check um, it out. And I have a lot of questions here from oh, wow. Dennis Pastorizo, wants to know um, what are some of the best places to find works from emerging artists, um, which, which may have even changed in the last year too with the way things are. Where, where do you suggest? Um, you know what, there's, there's a, uh, there's a, of course looking at gallery, um, but I think looking at publications, there's a, there's a small publication called New American Painting. I don't know if you look at okay. that one yourself, Jackie. Yeah, it's a great one. That's a great one. But the, the advice that I had read was really finding like-minded people, start having conversations, start reading, uh, look at any art forum, and, and go to find the best galleries wherever you live and start looking. And I think that there's a lot of wonderful galleries and there's some galleries that I think really have such an eye on the market. They actually have artists and launch their careers. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. And then he also wants to know, what is the best way to preserve your purchased artwork? So what are some of the things, you know, if, if you're creating a collection, it's great, you put it on the, on the wall. What are those other things that you should be thinking about um, that are less fun than going out and discovering artists in their studios? <laughs> Yes, um, every single, uh, anything that's uh, delicate, drawings, photography, pastels, uh, watercolors, those are all framed with uh, the, uh, the UV Plexi, there's a special name for it. So I use the UV Plexi. Oil paintings, sometimes I frame them depending where they're going, sometimes I don't because those are sturdier, but definitely anything that's more delicate wants to have something over, some glazing on it. And then do you think about the light in the room or just the UV protecting, um, is that fine? So if, even if it's getting 
a lot of sunlight somewhere. No, I think you'll be careful. I thought all of my windows have uh, UV protection and I have sun shades. Um, I don't have full blackout, so everything is as protected as I can with a house that has, has a, a good deal of light. And you're pretty, I mean, LA itself, I think, is pretty climate controlled. You're not seeing vast fluctuations, but is that something else that you've built into your house? I know some collectors do that. Yes, yeah, so the, the house, it's always between 68 and 72. So it's all year long. And so is the storage where I keep the art. That's great. That's good to know. And then he has a question about selling art too, which we haven't talked about. I feel like you, you buy and store, but um, you know, are there any ways, like, is it difficult to know the value of art, especially in a market that's always changing? Well, you know, that's such a great question. The yeah. value of art, I know. That is, that's actually a whole philosophical conversation. <laughs> but, but in more, in more um, operational terms, you know, it's, if you build a collection of any size, it's important to have it reappraised from time to time because things do go up. Right. Um, I'm not a seller, you know, yeah. even when, you know, Mwako obviously is, is someone who had an incredible rise. I think there was fear of glut on the market. And even myself as, as somebody who's collecting more emerging, it could have been a time to, to you know, divest myself of what, but I don't buy to sell, I buy because I love. Right. No, that's, it's, I mean, so I guess even if you're not selling, it's good to know for insurance purposes yes. as well and keep on top of that. Um, and then, I mean, and Dennis also has a question about investing in art, but I, I feel like that's not really what you're doing either you're you're buying because you have a true passion for it but um you know where there are certain types of pieces that are surefire invest investments that will increase over time i don't know <laughs> it was not, it's so it's so funny it, it is an area of collecting it's not my area of collecting yeah. and there are also those um scoundrels in the art market who buy to flip right um, which is not what not what i or my friends are about that's good i know um Galleries like to hear that, and artists do too. Yes, no, we buy for passion, not for not for investment. And so, um, you know who you're looking at next. You have some sculpture coming in. Um, are you attending any art fairs right now? Are you looking at things online? Oh man, now are I want to cry. I'm looking at like, I'm looking online, of course, but I miss art fairs so much. I was talking to a couple of galleries this week. And they're very intense, especially for the galleries who are attending, you know, myriad oh shows per year. Yeah. And when the the lockdown, the pandemic first happened, everybody was like, oh, we get a break. And everybody's like, I miss my friends. I miss seeing things, you know, IRL in real life. So I am hoping that I can go to the Armory show in September. Me too. We're so excited about that and have been talking to them a lot um, at the Armory show and you know, how we can be a part of that because it's going to be great. They're in a new location. There's going to be so much going on. And um, especially when you're, um, when you're collecting for passion, I think there's something magical that happens when you see it in person that sometimes like you, you don't have that instant love when it's, you know, a JPEG. Right. Yes. Totally. It's just, it's just not the same because you get to have conversations with the galleries, with the collectors, with your friends, with the artists, and it's a, it's a completely different experience. You can get lit up in the space, not to mention having a little glass of champagne while you're walking around. I know. The whole thing starts to feel like very fizzy and giddy and I know. bubbling. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> All of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> Um, Thomas, thank you so much. I, I could talk to you for so long because just your knowledge and your passion for art and design are absolutely inspiring. Again, you know, having you and your home in this issue is just a joy for us and our readers. So thank you everyone for joining us today. This has just been absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you, Jackie. It was nice to see you. Okay. Good to see you too. Thank you. Everyone pick up the winter issue of Gallery Magazine and check us out online at gallerymagazine.com. And you can also subscribe there. So thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.